Thank you, Peter. As Peter said, I'm going to talk about giving maps a second life with digital technologies. This image that you're seeing on the screen here uh, was made by Edward Quinn, a map maker, in 1830. He made this map of the Garden of Eden. They, they still believed in the creation in those days. In the time of the deluge, with the rest of the earth then unknown, and this thus covered in the dark clouds of ignorance. In the next dozen or so maps in his historical atlas that follow this one, he shows the expansion of geographical knowledge over 4,000 years, up to the late 1800, up to 1830, by the recession of the clouds of ignorance at key time periods in history. I think Quinn's series of maps is a paradigm for the growth of geographic knowledge in our own time. Yet, our geographic ignorance in the recent past has been caused not by lack of geographic knowledge. We certainly have an enormous amount of that. Rather, it's been caused by the lack of good means to disseminate widely that knowledge. Today, in the short period of just a decade, we are seeing how digital technologies, most prominently GIS, geographic information systems, but increasingly now virtual reality, databases, search engines, online mapping services, all offer the possibility of disseminating geographic knowledge on a scale not imagined by Quinn. As search engines themselves increasingly use maps to filter and display information, I don't think it's overstating things to say that maps are becoming a large part of web users' experiences, certainly beyond the proportion of use that maps receive in the static print world. In fact, it was clear before the web that maps were going in the opposite direction less use by people, less geographic literacy, a shrinking share of the knowledge base, really Quinn's cloud maps moving in reverse. But fortunately, mapping, I think, is now poised to become both a library system, and I'll show some examples of that in the talk, the spatial organization of knowledge, and a series of public tools to create that system of knowledge. It's the perfect mix, really, for the user-driven web world. Going forward, this will create not just increased geographic literacy, but will increase people's ability to even think spatially, to see cause and effect in the environment in spatial terms, which we know is so important today. Looking backwards, it's already had a big impact on historical analysis as GIS and historical studies have been joined, uniting history and geography in the academy once again after a long period of separation and reminding us that everything happens somewhere, not just sometime. These technologies have given all maps a second life, and for me, this digital revolution has enabled the recreation, as Peter said, of my old analog paper historical map library into an ever-evolving online resource for people interested in the evolution of this fascinating juncture of science, art, and history that historical maps embody all available at my online map library portal for the last 10 years, davidrumsey.com. I remembered that seven years ago I gave a talk at a DLF forum in Pittsburgh that showed the very first uses I was making of GIS as applied to historical maps. Today I'll show how that process has evolved in the ensuing years and other tools that I've added, especially my recent forays into virtual worlds like Second Life and Google Earth. As libraries today increasingly realize that their analog special collections are the unique knowledge resources that they must digitize and turn into online libraries, I hope that my trajectory of transforming my physical map library into a library of content and tools may have some relevance. This journey started about 10 years ago in my map library in San Francisco, shown here when I realized that I could give no new life to my old maps by making them available to people over the internet. My motivation, above all, was to give the maps away digitally again and again, and to share with people all the aspects of old maps that make them so interesting and compelling, all the reasons that I collected them. Instead of just giving the collection to an institutional library where it would be preserved, but access would be limited, Using these new technologies, I saw that I could give the collection digitally to a huge number of people in all parts of the world. I was determined to set a new model of a kind of digital philanthropy, the gift of a private collection through giving 
the images, the metadata, and the software tools. To accomplish this, I've developed various tools and platforms over the past decade. I've been able to share the collection with over 20 million people worldwide. The trajectory that I've followed begins with making the first digital images in the late 1990s through development of a digital image library, then using GIS to unlock information in the historical maps, then putting the maps in Google Earth, and very recently opening a map library in Second Life. I'll show many examples of the unlocking of the rich information that exists in historical map that can occur with digital technologies through juxtaposition of images, image overlays, radical image reformatting, image mashups, and image compositing, just to name a few. As these views of my map library show, I collected a lot of historical maps. I was your typical out of control collector. Over 150,000 at last count in a period of about 25 years. These paper maps, charts, globes, and atlases are all the sources for the digital images in my online library. And they are visual history as well, and they tell us much about the times in which they were made. My collection covers roughly the period from 1700 to 1925. It includes maps of the entire world with a special focus on images of North America. This map of North America here by Guillaume de Lille, 1700, sort of bookends the early part of my collecting interest. And these three maps by John Bartholomew and the first edition of the London Times Atlas, also of North America, 1922, show the other end of my collecting interest. One of the themes that I explored with historical maps is the evolution of mapping technology itself over time and how it relates to our modern day GIS. Because obviously all mapping now, all modern cartography is GIS. So I began by learning the science of GIS. I actually began to see GIS principles in past mapping systems. I wrote about this in a book I wrote with Edie Punt called Cartographic Extraordinaire. These are a couple of the illustrations from that book. These same digital technologies transform me as a collector by allowing me to reverse the process of acquiring maps into a process of sharing and distributing them by building a new digital collection and eventually allowing me, which I'll show some of, even to collect digital copies of maps when I did not own the original paper map. My first use of technology with regard to the collection was creating a database to catalog all the maps. I'm sure I was a librarian in another life. Like many of you, I enjoyed filling in the blanks. I did this all the time I was collecting. This laid the groundwork for creating a virtual library, though at that stage it did not include images of the maps, only detailed descriptions. Then I began to make digital images of the maps by scanning them at high resolution. I began to see things in these scan maps that I could not see as easily in the original. I'll show you an example here. This is Lewis and Clark's famous 1814 map published in Philadelphia of their trek up the Missouri River and onto the Pacific Ocean. Looking at the Lewis and Clark map, I was studying the way they had mapped the Missouri River, and particularly this grand detour, which is a very prominent feature of the river, a huge bend. At the same time, I acquired John Mellish's map of the United States, the first map to show the country coast to coast, published just two years later, also in Philadelphia. And I realized Mellish had lifted everything from the Lewis and Clark map. Looking at the images digitally, I was able to compare the Mellish and see how he called it now the Great Bend. And putting the Lewis and Clark next to it, again in digital form, because these maps are vastly different size. The Lewis and Clark is about this big. The Mellish is about six feet across. I realized this was a wonderful way to begin to study the maps and to learn more about them. So after I had compiled, I don't know, several hundred of these digital images, fortunately for me, the internet evolved in the mid-90s. And I realized I could take these digital images and use them not just for my own research, but also to share the collection. So I launched the online library in 99 with 2,000 images. As I said, the site is free to all users. This changed everything about my work. Suddenly, I had thousands of people a day using my online maps, and I was the proprietor, like many of you, of a virtual library. 
davidrumsey.com is the hub for my content building. Today we have over 17,000 maps online. And for my experiments with software to view and understand that content.